I've heard about it. <laughs> Dead lines. So, my name is Nathaniel Plan. I'm an oceanographer across the street at the USGS, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you Ott Reniers, who's from uh, the Rosenfield uh, School of Oceanography. Marine science. Marine science, whatever, <laughs> uh, in Miami. And Ott, uh, you already see what his uh, presentation is about. Um, I know Ott for many years now and worked with him and basically worked with him and his, uh, his expertise in numerical modeling of coastal beach processes, moving sand around, moving water around. Um, and so I don't know what the hell he's doing with this problem with germs. Stuff. So that's, you that, need that's to wash your hands here. when you leave right. here. <laughs> um, and, and so th this, this will be an exciting talk for me to see. I, I hope it's exciting for everyone. Um, and so Ott's been at uh, uh, Rosenfield for about five years now and uh, has been working on, on modeling. And he's even, uh, in that time, written a book with one of his colleagues. It's called A Guide to uh, Modeling Coastal Morphology. And how many people are modelers here? OK. Two. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, if, if those of you who want to get into modeling after you see this talk, uh, there's lots of great resources. So with that, I'll let Ott take over. Thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually. Uh, Amazed that there's so many people here at 3:30 on a Friday. I was thinking everybody's gone, but then again, I've never had a seminar where I can just drink beer while I'm presenting. That's, <laughs> that is phenomenal. So, uh, thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, so, yes, my background is in modeling. I, do, I also do other things. Um, this is uh, part of the motivation why we did this study. Uh, the, uh, what you see here is, first of all, the, the work, most of the work that I'm presenting is uh, done uh, by my PhD student, Ji uh, Xuan Fang. Um, he's uh, finishing this summer, and a lot of it is uh, uh, coming out in a uh, journal paper in water resources research this, uh, this spring. Um, my co-workers are Brian House from uh, Rasmus, the uh, Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, and uh, Helena Solo Gabriela, who's uh, at the Civil Engineering and uh, Environmental Engineering Department. Um, I'm talking about entracoxi um, to uh, as a measure of uh, water quality. So the uh, EPA uses uh, concentrations of entracoxi um, to determine whether the water is safe or unsafe. And if it's unsafe, uh, that means that the uh, concentration is more than 104 colony forming units per 100 mil. So that's what you see over here. And then they give uh, a beach advisory. The samples uh, in this, for this specific uh, image um, were taken weekly. So the EPA samples weekly at a, a large number of beaches. And these dots correspond to the approximate location of the beach, not the exact location of the beach, okay? But the approximate locations of the beach. And then this number on the right is the exceedance percentage. So that tells you if the number is 40, then the 40% of the samples, of the weekly samples, exceed the, um, the 104 CFUs per 100 mil, and hence the water is deemed to be unsafe. Um, and what you see is there's a lot of spatial variability in the, in the distributions. Um, this, on this side, which is the Atlantic Ocean facing side, that seems to be relatively clean. Uh, for you guys over here, it really depends on where you are. Some spots seem to be not so good. Other spots um, are uh, perfectly clean. Uh, so the question we had was, well, you know, what, what does it mean and is this something that is persistent? So this is for 2006. This is 2006. This is 2007, 8 and 9. And um, it does change year by year, but you can, you can point at a number of locations where there are persistently high exceedance percentages of entracoxide. And to let you know, and I think most of you will know, entracoxide don't make you ill. 
but they are a uh, indicator bacteria for other organisms that do make you ill. And there is evidence that if you have high levels of enterococci, there's a good likelihood that there's parasites and other bacteria in the water that you don't want to ingest. So uh, there is clearly evidence of areas where there's high bacteria levels compared to other areas. Um, we at Rasmus are located here, and we have one beach, it's called Hobie Beach, which is known for its bad water quality. <laughs> Although, if you compare it to these other places, it's maybe not so bad. Uh, but Hobie Beach is also known as Dog Beach, and it's one of the few beaches where people are allowed to have their dogs at the beach. So it's always been uh, the, uh, the idea that because of the dogs and, you know, whatever dogs do, uh, that water quality is bad. Um, but I'm going to show you that, well, that may be true, but it's not the whole answer to the question. So what we like to do is we like to understand what makes these beaches uh, have bad water quality. And, and this is where I come in, can we construct a model that predicts what's happening at a beach based on the processes. And if we have a process-based model, then ideally you can apply that model to different locations, or at least you can try to figure out what it represents. Uh, and I say in progress because uh, it's not done. All right, so to give you a little background about Hobie Beach and uh, Rasmus, um, we're located on Virginia Key, Key Biscayne, Miami, Atlantic Ocean, and as you can see, the beach is located over here, so it's really well sheltered from the ocean waves. So you only have locally wind-generated waves. Um, and it has, um, let's see. Yeah, you can't really see it on this one, I'll get to it. The tide, so the tide comes in through a uh, bear cut, and uh, I think this is government cut, and it, it sort of goes around the island and it meets in the middle. And as a result, there's almost no tidal uh, exchange and diffusion at Hobie Beach. So if you put something there, it's going to stay there for a while. That's part of the problem. Can I add some more yeah, yeah. ancient history? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> in the 1950s, uh, all the sewage went into Biscayne Bay, and especially the Miami River was an open sewer and I, I learned to water ski at what they call Hobie Beach now and let me tell you it was pretty nasty shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, um, <laughs> I think actually there's somebody who just filed a lawsuit against um, uh, the Virginia, so there's, there's a sewage treatment plant now in Virginia Key um, and they have a pipe that goes out I think one and a half miles um, and then the treated water gets uh, disposed of. And they've done measurements uh, in the past trying to figure out you know, whether there's any point sources, like for instance, if you have the pipe uh, with the uh, wastewater treatment plant. And at that time, there was no evidence that there was any point sources associated with, let's say, the Miami River or the, or, or the treatment plant. Um, somebody's alleging that the pipes are leaking, and because of that, it gets back in the water and uh, she was in a kayak and got exposed and got ill and now she's suing. So, um, but I'm going to start on the premises that that is not what we're looking at at Hobie Beach. And I, can think, I, I think I can convince you that that's not the case. Okay? So feel free to have, ask questions. I mean, I, I don't, all right? Things, if things are not clear, just go ahead. So it's a pretty narrow beach, uh, thin, Strip of sand, this is uh, part of a flood delta. Rasmus is over here. Um, based on previous research, uh, we know that, first of all, that there's a relatively high percentage of exceedance. Then, turns out there's a lot of anthracoxi that are residing in the sand. And uh, the bad news is, once they're in the sand and the conditions are, are favorable, they multiply. So um, the way this system seems to work is that the sand is a reservoir for intracoxide. And I think this is not only Hobie Beach, but you'll find this at many beaches. And what we're trying to do is use this as a test case to develop, to develop this model. Okay, so we're, we're starting with existing knowledge on uh, 
on the local site. Uh, uh, we're gonna, what we want to do is we want to add a lot of data, and I'll come to that in a second. Then combine it with a numerical model, which in this case is X-Beach, is a shallow water model. And I'll, I'll tell you something about the model, not too much. Put all of that into what we call a microbe hydrodynamic morphodynamic <coughs> model. So that means we, me we measure the hydrodynamics, so waves and currents. Uh, we measure the, uh, the microbe response, and we're trying to measure the sediment response. And all of that cu coupled should give us uh, an idea of what's going on. And then we can use it for uh, hindcast and uh, validation. At this point, we've done the hindcast. We're working on validation using other data sets. And then if we're happy with it, in principle, you could use it for a forecast mode. Um, and if it works, then we can extract something about the important processes, which we can then use to try to interpret the first picture that I've shown you. Now for the experiment, so for the data to, to constrain this model, uh, we decided to set up a new field experiment. And I told you that uh, the EPA measures the water quality once a week. Um, if you want to know what's happening to enterococci at a beach, uh, you need to sample at least within the tidal period, because otherwise you know, you're missing a large part of the signal. So um, I convinced the people that were doing the, uh, um, the microbe sampling to do an experiment where we, me we would measure for 10 days, day and night, and every hour. And they would run the lab. I don't know how many of you are familiar with culturing enterococci, but they would run the lab 24 hours a day trying to get these measurements to us. And they said, well, you can do a scenario where you measure at knee depth, for hourly samples, but we're not gonna allow you to measure the waste depth for every hour because we can't cope with that kind of data. So we had a trade-off where we said, well, we'll do knee depth, hourly, and not waste depth. And the reason to do knee depth and waste depth is because that's uh, typically what's being used by the Florida Department of Health or the EPA. Um, so they had to be cultured, so you, you put them in a the lab, um, you get the results 24 hours later. Um, for the modeling part, we did a, uh, a survey with a backpack. Let's see, I think this actually, yeah. Oh. So what you see here is uh, the measure bathymetry. So somebody walks around with a backpack and a GPS. And uh, by traversing the beach, we get to know where the water line is and subtitle bar and things like that. Yes? Just briefly, how do you, um, derive the enterococci out of the sand? Do you, how do you entice them out? Do you put it in oh. solution and then? Yes, so uh, the actual sampling method was uh, we had uh, a plastic, two plastic bags, sterilized. We would go out so that these individu individual poles um, were designated per day. So one day you would start from, let's say, this pole uh, you would take a sample here, uh, somewhere at the high, uh, the high water line, and then uh, at knee depth, and you would go in the water, slowly, so without trying to stir up a lot of sediment, take a water sample and store that, and then take your bag and scoop up a sand sample, and put that in the bag, sterilized spoon. Then that was taken back to the lab, uh, it was diluted, um, then at uh, different um, uh, volumes. Then they would sample, they would culture the water sample. And then for the sand sample, um, what they would do is they would stir up the sand, trying to release all the bacteria that were on the sand and then culture that. And then for the water sample, you would get colony forming units per volume. So in this case, 100 mil. And for the sand sample, you would get uh, C of use per gram. And that, that was the method that was done. And the idea is, these, because we're sampling every hour, you don't want to sample at the same location every day because then you know you're going to contaminate your sampling. So that's why we sample at different locations. Okay. Other questions? Um, so with the bathymetry, we needed to have uh, the boundary conditions for the model, uh, which in this case was obtained with a, 
just a pressure sensor that measured wave height and tidal elevation. And we also had an ADCP, um, which was located somewhere out here. And this is actually part of a channel. Um, somebody picked it up, and uh, it was never seen again. So <laughs> we don't have the current measurements. Uh, somebody has them. Um, and then for the rainfall and the local wind, um, we use the weather pack station at the Rasmus building. Okay, so and it was done in the summer, uh, which is nice and warm and wet. Now, this is a these are the anthracoxide samples in the water and within the sand, and the individual measurements, the blue. Uh, individual measurements are the uh, circles at the waist, at the knee depth, and then the waist depth is the magenta. Uh, and then the EPA limit, so to tell you when the beach water is safe or unsafe, is the big red dashed line. And this, the time span is about uh, 10 days. And the first thing that you see, if you look at this, and keep in mind, this is a, this is a log scale, right? So this is one CFU per 100 mil, and this is 1,000. So on any given day, if you go to Hobie Beach and you measure the, the, the concentration of anthrac oxide, then uh, it, can order, it can vary by at least an order of magnitude, typically two. And this sort of... You know, puts uh, the weekly sampling by the EPA uh, into context in the sense that if you do a weekly sample, there's a lot of variability in there that you're not resolving. So the uncertainty about these samples is pretty high. Um, the other thing you see is it makes a lot of difference whether you sample at uh, knee depth, which is the blue, or waist depth. If you sample at knee depth, then 43% of the samples are actually above the threshold level, and this beach should have been closed for most of the time. If you measure at waist depth, it's only 5% of the samples that exceed it. So it's when, when you sample and where you sample. Um, now you have to keep in mind that the sampling, because the sampling is done at a given depth, because of the tide, the sampling location is moving up and down the beach, right? So the, let's say this is the super tidal beach where everything stays dry, and then this is the water line, so this is time. Then the sampling location with respect to the shore is moving up and down. And you can see that really nicely in the sand samples. So the times when it's low typically correspond at low tide, when we were away from the beach. And if we were close to the water line, uh, close to the super tidal beach, then we had high levels of anthrac oxide. So what you're seeing here is biased, or it's, uh, I don't know what you call it, biased, but it's a, part of it is explained by the fact that we're not sampling at the same location all the time, but we're moving. Yeah? Did you right. take transects right across the beach to see how it varied from the shore up at just one time? We, well, what we did was we compiled all these results, and I'll show that in a minute, yeah. Um, so, key message, a lot of variability in both water and sand. Then uh, the tide, so the tidal range is in the order of half a meter. Uh, it's uh, semi-diurnal. Um, the waves, so this is the tidal elevation measured by the wave recorder. This is, these are the waves, the local waves. And I told you that you know, this beach is well protected from the ocean waves, so you have only, the only waves are that arrive at this beach are locally wind-generated waves, and they correlate well with the onshore wind speed. And the wave height is in the order of 10 centimeters to 20 centimeters, so that's small. In addition to wind-generated waves, um, if not tiny, in addition to wind-generated waves, there's also boat waves. A lot of go fast. Yeah, <laughs> those may be bigger. <laughs> um, but the fact that this correlates well with the wind tells us that it's dominated, at least for this time period, uh, by the wind-generated waves. And then solar radiation, so a nice diurnal signal when, you know, when the sun is high, uh, there's a lot of solar radiation. And solar radiation is important because it inactivates or it kills the bacteria. And then the rain um, is episodic. 
uh, says local convective thunderstorms, and they are uh, they were pretty severe when we were there. Uh, I had our family tent up on the beach, um, just you know, just sit outside of the outside of the sun to provide some shade, and the whole thing just got shred to pieces during one of these local thunderstorms. It was just <laughs> all gone. So lots of rain locally. All right, so the concepts for the model are in this busy slide. Um, I'm so the beach is the big yellow blob. The water, the instantaneous water level with the waves are the blue line, and then uh, you see a, a very low dune, which is representative, I think, for most of Florida. Um, and then within the sand, we assume that there's Antracoxi, so these red zones are areas where the sand is contaminated with bacteria. There's also, so the bacteria I denoted by these, uh, these blue stars. There's also uh, groundwater, and uh, based, on, uh, uh, based on measurements that we've done, about 10% of the bacteria is actually in the in interstitial space in the groundwater. The other ones are attached to the sand. And the idea is now that you know, when the waves come, they stir up a lot of the sand. If the sand starts moving, these different grain sizes start rubbing against one another, and that would destroy the attachment of the bacteria, and then they would get released from the sand. So what you see here, the red dots are, let's say, contaminated sand. So that, has, that is sand that has bacteria on it. Uh, these little blue dots are, are anthracoxide released from the contaminated sand, and then we have clean sand, which is the yellow part. Uh, so release from suspended and mobilized sand is, is the main mechanism for getting bacteria in the water. But on top of that, we have entrainment and groundwater flow. So we're modeling the groundwater flow, um, and that takes um, the bacteria that's within the inter interstitial space into the sand or out of the sand, depending on the direction of the flow. Um, then the distribution of uh, the bacteria in the crossshore is determined by the transport due to advection and diffusion. So that could be due to uh, return of uh, wave-related mass flux, uh, there's turbulent diffusion. Um, we are assuming that's a long stream uniform, and the tide, so there's a tidal variation that we include, but it has no currents, it's just a vertical tide. Um, and then the solar radiation by the sun, which is killing off the bacteria once they're in the water. Okay, so to come back to Nathaniel's question, so this middle panel shows you our initial distribution. Actually, we assume it's constant. It's the distribution of the enterococci as CFUs per gram within the model, okay? And these green dots, purple, uh, cyan, yellow, uh, Magenta, those are all the measurements that we obtained during the 10 days. And the red dots are the mean. The space, the, it's a spatial and time average mean. And then we drew a line through that. So the blue line is our estimate of the distribution of intracoxi in the sand. Right, this is just in the sand, not the water. And it's logarithmic. Um, and the way it translates in the model is that there's a fraction of clean sand and a fraction of contaminated sand. And if uh, close to the waterline, the super tidal part of the beach, you can see that almost everything we assume is to be contaminated. And if you move away from the beach, there's almost no enterococci in the sand. Uh, okay, so. Then if you look at, the, at a single cell, so this is a single cell within the model, um, we have hydrodynamics and morphodynamics. We have uh, the water phase, which is just the wave and the tide, and then we have um, the groundwater phase, which is down here below, with distributions of contaminated sand and clean sand. And in principle, what we've done, we've used, we only use this upper layer, but in principle, this model will allow you to look at the distribution, the stratigraphy of anthracoxi or bacteria or whatever 
in the sand. Then we have uh, sediment transport. Um, so we have suspended sediment coming in and going out, and we have bed load sediment coming in and going out. Um, then we have deposition and uptake of sediment. So this is from the bed into the water column. And then for the microbalance, we have bacteria that are coming in and going out. So this is just the advection, transport of bacteria. Uh, we have the release from the suspended sediment and we have the release from the bed load sediment. Um, and we have entrainment and groundwater flow. So that can take bacteria in and out of the water and the sand. And then we have runoff from rain and solar rain activation, which is the only major sink term in this model. And that, that's the model without any equations. What do you yes. see as your most tenuous variable? Um, the uh, release from uh, from the from the, suspen the suspended and the bed load sediment, because in reality that's a function of the the degree of attachment. So these uh, bacteria they form uh, <coughs> biofilms and they attach to the sediment and you need to have some mechanical forcing to release it. And uh, we tried to do this in the lab, tried to figure out you know, what if you have certain wave conditions, how many bacteria will you get. Um, what happened in the lab was that after the first experiment, a number of uh, bacteria got stuck into the pump circulation system. And I really like it there. <laughs> so the next experiment, we filled up the tank and then we did a pre-experiment uh, measure of the amount of bacteria in the water and in the sand. And it was just... So then we had to spike the sand with even more bacteria and you, well, you can see where that is going. So that was, it's not a trivial task. But that, that is, a, yeah, I would say that's the key question. Okay, so the model results are given here. Um, again, on the horizontal axis is time um, in days. This is the cross shore position. The beach is at the top, and you can so this is actually the water line, and you can see the, the water line changed to, because of the tide. The, the colors are predicted anthracoxide levels on the log scale. Um, and what you see is that there's really high levels really close to the water line and then there's a diffusive behavior as you move further offshore. Uh, the other thing you see is that um, during the daytime, um, and that's what explains the diurnal system, the sun really is capable of killing off a lot of these bacteria. But then at night, uh, during the night, you get really, really high levels. So this tells you that you know if you are if you want to measure water quality if you measure at noon during the day you're much more likely to have water that is less um, contaminated than during the night okay so of course the good news is that most people swim when it's nice and hot that's the good news so the comparison between model and observations is in the middle panel so the observations are the little blue uh, circles and there's a lot of variability with it, so because of that we did a three hour mean, so that's that solid blue line. And then the model prediction at the waist depth location is the um, magenta line. Um, and it is not a perfect match, uh, but if you look at the correlation between the two, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's over 0.5. So the model is capable of explaining at least a significant part of the variability that we see in the observations. Um, which is the, uh, the other things that are on here are wave events. So the, sur the sorry, the crosses are when the waves are high, and the rain events are the, the red triangles. Um, it does a much better job at the uh, knee deep location than at the waist deep location, and uh, and we think that part of that is well. First of all, the number of observations that we have here is very limited, um, which makes a comparison more difficult, especially given given the fact that there's such a high temporal variability in the measurements. Um, and the other thing is that um, this behavior is, you'll see, is really controlled by cross-shore diffusion. 
so what we see from this and the uh, measurements and modeling is that there's a rapid decay in the offshore direction and there's really strong diurnal and tidal cycles, which are represented by the model. <coughs> and this is to show you at times, this is typically at times at night, uh, when the water is high and the waves are strong, that's when you don't want to go swimming, okay? Even though the people that surf may want to do that anyway. Um, so the next thing we did was uh, we ran the model, because now we have a model that has some skill, we ran the model for different scenarios. So the baseline scenario is the upper one, and now the uh, enterococci levels are in, uh, uh, not on a log scale, but on a, on a linear scale. And we can compare that to the case where we have no waves. So this is a scenario without waves, and clearly there's a, the release from bacteria is much reduced. Part of that is because, you know, this is the model. This is how we put in the bacteria in the first place. So, um, but it suggests, that because the, the, you know, the reasonable comparison with the observations, it suggests that the waves are an important parameter in releasing the bacteria. Then without rainfall, um, if there's no waves, it makes a big difference. So this is a high concentration at a time when the waves are small, and it's solely uh, due to the runoff associated with the rain. If you have uh, high levels due to the waves, then the rain doesn't do that much anymore because you know, the levels are already high. And then the bottom one is uh, the mixing. So if we turn off the mixing in, within the model, the diffusive processes in the model, then uh, all of the anthracoxide sort of hug the shoreline. Um, and this is not what we're seeing. But it's, it tells us that the mixing is, is really important in the far field mixing, uh, the far field uh, values of the enterococci. So the most important findings are that uh, if we look at the source, um, it looks like the intertidal sand, the release from the intertidal sand by the waves and, uh, and uh, the tidal exposure is the most important uh, factor. Then the sink is the, uh, the sunlight uh, inactivation and to some degree the diffusion. And all of this is driven by the, the distribution of enterococci in the sand. Okay, so if you have enterococci in the sand, then the hydrodynamics will determine the actual release. Now, what determines the microbial quality of beach sand? And this is uh, where I go out on a limb because I don't know. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm not a microbiologist. Uh, I know something about modeling and I know a little bit about observations, but uh, I do know that, you know, if, oh, sorry, I do know that if you have uh, dogs on the beach, it's definitely going to be a nice source of enterococci. But uh, Xiao Fang Zhu has shown that if you start with, a, let's say, a dog's Species and you start modeling, you cannot explain the levels of bacteria that we see at this beach. So it's not enough. Uh, adding birch and shrimp doesn't do it either. Human shedding, if you have a lot of people, it just doesn't add up. So the only way we can get to the levels that we're seeing is by explaining it by regrowth of bacteria within the sand. Then the regrowth, the, um, that, determines, that is determined by things like nutrition, uh, it's really sensitive to moisture content, temperature. Uh, you can imagine that it depends on grain size, porosity, sediment type, uh, predation, etc. So it's it is something that we'd like to understand, uh, but at this point we don't understand. But once you, I think, once you have a handle on predicting the sand quality, you're much better, better equipped in predicting the water quality. But um, EPA only measures water quality. It does not measure sand quality. Um, and then the attachment to the sand, that comes back to your question. So what, the, greatest, the greatest uncertainty is, is the response or the release of bacteria if they're subjected to mechanical forcing. And that really depends on <coughs> biofilms. Once you get a colony of these things growing in the sand, do you have to keep adding more or can they just take off as long as they're getting as, as long as they have nutrients then 
Because this place has a history I'll tell you about later on. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, as long as there's nutrients, um, they can grow. Uh, after we did the experiment... And anaerobes, right? They're anaerobes? Uh, yes. As far as far I, as I, I went to Winnipeg before I came down here. So. Uh, okay, but the thing is, so what's interesting though is, is after this experiment, they did a big beach nourishment and they trucked in sand from a quarry, and uh, basically got rid of all the anthracoxide. Mm -hmm. And right now the levels are way way lower than they were ever. So it needs it needs a source within the sand to keep growing. Yeah, I meant to ask because um, I lived in Miami and recently moved up here and. I remember when they were doing the whole restoration project and they removed all the old Australian pines yeah. and replanted that. So I think it was about that time when they started it or when they were in the midst of it because it took about a year or so and I was wondering, was that going on at the time? Or that was after, after we did, after? yeah, so after we did the experiment. Actually, we we uh, we had planned the exper to do the experiment later but, but because they were planning this beach nourishment, we rushed in and did it before they removed all of the beach. Uh, but uh, right now, if you go to Hobie Beach, the water quality is way, way better than it used to be. Okay. And you're, you're only, you're less than a mile from the Miami sewage treatment plant. <laughs> In fact, you, you can smell it when the wind's right if you're on Hobie Beach. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, that's true, yeah. Uh, but also the, the solar inactivation, once it's in the water, is really efficient. And that's why you see it drop so dramatically during the day. Um, so it's, it's not enough to have a, a source. They need to establish themselves and they need to be able to, to grow. And it needs a little more than just getting there. So, um, so from this, uh, we decided that, no, there's a lot of stuff we can't control. But one thing we know something about is, is the action of waves and tides. And uh, the stirring of uh, the sediment uh, is, is in a large part governed by the waves. If you have big waves, a lot of sediment gets stirred up. It, let's say if you start with a situation where you have a lot of bacteria in the sand, then a major part of that would be released and transported and die off. And it would actually keep the levels low. Okay, so if you have small waves, uh, we hypothesize that you're likely to have high concentrations, but if the waves crank up, and actually there's some evidence of that, if you let's say if you have a hurricane, after the hurricane, a lot of these bacteria are gone. Uh, so if the waves are able to decimate the population, then you expect to have low concentrations, and in the cases where the waves can't really get to the super tidal beach, um, you expect to have higher concentrations. So the with that in mind, we think that the beach slope is a, an important parameter because if you have a very mild slope, then the waves break over a very, very large area. They're small, they don't stir up a lot of water, the currents are weak. If you have a steeper slope, um, the wave action is much more vigorous and you expect that that actually puts a lot more sediment in suspension and gets rid of your bacteria. So what I did next was for all the beaches along the Florida coast, that are monitored by the, monitored by the, by the EPA. Um, I calculated the percentage of exceedance over a 10 year time period. So this is based on the weekly samples, but 10 years of it. So this is a lot of samples. And then I plot the percentage of exceedance on the horizontal axis on the log scale and the beach slope on the, oh, sorry, on the vertical. And the beach slope is on the horizontal, also on the log scale. Uh, but you do see that there's a nice correlation. So there is some evidence that, uh, that there's a connection with the beach slope where steeper beaches have less bacteria. And very mild beaches have high values of bacteria and the corresponding exceedance. Where's that lowest dot? <laughs> well, so you have to keep in mind, <laughs> you have to keep in mind that uh, I just, we. For each beach, we determined what the local slope was, and then we binned the slopes in very narrow bins. And for each bin, we have multiple measurements. So you cannot point to a specific beach. However, if you're on a beach that has a very mild slope, then there's a good chance that the water is bad. That's what this is telling you. And um, that's it. So.